Thanks. Hello, VIP group for Empowered Women of Chicago. We you are on. Did it. I did it. We <laughs> night four. Uh, we are here for night four of um, Purse Strings coming in and bringing our professionals uh, to educate and empower all the women in this group just a little bit more. So we have Anna here tonight um, and she is from Chicago as well. Yes. Are you in the city, city, Anna? I'm actually in the north and northwest suburbs. The office is in the north suburbs and I live in the northwest suburbs, but I grew up in Chicago. Okay. 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 Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah. So Anna's an attorney and she's going to share what Maggie actually coined as our love letters, um, all the different documents that help our family members should something happen to us and doesn't make that in, in the way that you have these written up when you think it through then your family doesn't go crazy if you have something happen to you so love letters and instructions to your family very important like uh maggie also said not sexy but important. very important yeah Nick, that's a great way of the subject absolutely <laughs> I like to entice them somehow <laughs> talk about it in terms of the last gift you're giving your family because yeah. you're giving them with a mess at a time when they're grieving or maybe still trying to deal with making medical decisions on your behalf, they are able to not have to deal with certain financial issues. Yeah. And everybody has a story, right? You hear about these horror stories that go on because these documents weren't in place. So it's about just knuckling down and taking the next steps and getting them done and then you're in place. Absolutely. And yeah. I realize it can be difficult to kind of face your own mortality, right? Because yeah. it this requires you to think about, okay, what do I want to see happen? Mm -hmm. What do I yeah. want Emily to do? And what do I want my legacy to look like? Mm -hmm. But once you start thinking about it, you realize I'm actually doing something for them. I'm being pro. Yes. And if you choose not to do anything, you can either write your own will or the state of Illinois will write one for you. And you might not like the one they write for you. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's, that's absolutely a true statement because the Illinois Probate Act that deals with wills actually requires certain things to happen if you don't exclude them in your will. Right. And I'm about that. But let's start with something a little bit easier. Let's start with powers of attorney. Let's stop right there for a second. Let Maggie introduce you and you can have the full floor. Okay. So, yeah, let, me, let me give a little introduction to Anna before she jumps right in there, which is great. Um, Anna focuses on what is important to her client and helps them make educated educated decisions. When making decisions with a lifelong impact, it's important to discuss options. She believes in taking time to go over all the options, even in the nitty gritty details. Um, she likes to bring other professionals in like financial advisors to discuss these to discuss these decisions and what they might mean in the long run. Um, she's more than willing to support any of her clients' decisions. She just wants to know that they have been educated and informed. So um, like Barb said, she is um, an attorney in Chicago. And um, so yeah, now Anna, we'll hand it over to you. Take it away. That's a great introduction. So let's talk about powers of attorney. Um, a power of attorney allows someone else to make binding decisions on your behalf. And there are two different types, healthcare power of attorney and a financial one. Let's talk about healthcare first. So if you have a healthcare power of attorney, one, whoever is named as your agent will have access to your medical records in the event that you are incapacitated or unable to make medical decisions. And you can specify what triggers that. You can say, if my doctor determines in writing that I am incapable of making decisions on my own behalf, then... Um, my agent can make those decisions for me. And those decisions can involve regular medical care. Um, they can involve 
medical care at a point where a decision has to be made whether to extend your life and to take on all extraordinary measures, or maybe your choice is to just be kept comfortable and um, not have those extraordinary measures taken on your behalf. If you have a power of attorney prepared for healthcare, you can specify that in writing so your agent has some direction from you as to how you want to proceed. You can also specify in a healthcare power of attorney um, whether you would like to donate any organs. And you can be specific in terms of what you're willing to do, or maybe you're not comfortable with donating any organs. And again, you can specify that. You can also go into your final wishes. Are you um, wanting to be cremated or not? You can specify that for your agent. When you have a power of attorney prepared, it's important that you think about who you would want to make those important decisions on your behalf if you are not capable of making those decisions. And for you, that might mean someone who knows you very well and knows your wishes and will follow them even if their personal views or wishes might be different. So for example, let's say that you do not want any extraordinary measures taken on your behalf to preserve your life and you name your spouse as your agent for healthcare power of attorney. Will that person respect those wishes or will they indicate to the doctors that they want everything done in order to preserve your life because they love you and they want to keep you around? So that's an important consideration. Also, in powers of attorney in general, you usually want to pick the primary, the initial uh, agent, but you might also want to think about who should take over in the event your agent is incapable or unwilling to act as your agent, or maybe they predecease you, meaning they pass away before you need their help. So it's good to have that secondary person. Um, powers of attorney for healthcare in particular also come in handy if you have children who are turning 18 and might be going off to college because once they turn 18, they're legally an adult. And if something was to happen to them and there is no power of attorney, the doctors or medical professionals who are providing care might not, one, disclose medical information to you or might not accept your decisions on behalf of your now adult child. So it's an important conversation to have with your children. And once they are turning 18, have them actually execute or have powers of attorney for healthcare prepared. So that's just a brief primer on healthcare power of attorneys. Do we have any questions on that? And you're always welcome to ask questions a little bit later. Let's talk about now about powers of attorney for property, financial aspects. You can have a power of attorney that allows someone to act as your agent. Now, what is an agent? It's someone who can, can make legally binding decisions on your behalf. And you can limit the range of decisions they can make, or you can give them some sort of plenary power where they can make all financial decisions on your behalf. So for example, if someone is named as your agent in a um, property power of attorney, they can sign a contract and bind you to that contract. For example, they can sign a contract on your behalf and agree to sell or buy property. When does that come in handy? It comes in handy in real estate transactions. So for example, if I represent a seller in a real estate transaction and they don't want to go to a closing, they can sign a limited power of attorney for property. And that means that that power of attorney is only binding for that specific transaction for the real estate sale and for a limited period of time, usually 24 to 48 hours, just in case there are any issues at the closing and we need to wrap things up the following day. It's usually used for sellers in real estate transaction, 
because buyers generally are also signing mortgage documents. And for those, you actually need to be signing them yourself. Um, in terms of any limitations on property or powers of attorney for property, you want to specify um, when that power of attorney kicks in or, or begins. Because if you don't, it has binding power the moment you sign it. So for example, if I was to sign a power of attorney for property tomorrow, and it doesn't specify that it only is binding for a certain real estate transaction for a limited period of time, or it's only um, in force or has power, if a doctor determines that I'm incapacitated and cannot make decisions on my own behalf, then on Saturday morning, whoever I named as an agent could sign a contract obligating me to sell real estate, to buy real estate, to sell stocks, to buy stocks, basically undertake financial decisions. So you want to be careful with uh, powers of attorney for property. Next, next, let's talk about um, wills. And you probably heard me a little bit earlier tonight saying you can either have a will or the state of Illinois will write one for you. And in general, that will be true of most states because they would have some sort of a statute that directs how property is inherited or transferred. So having a, a will allows you to make certain decisions. For example, it allows you to decide who inherits from you and what. And it can be as specific as stating that a certain person is inheriting a certain um, piece of property, whether that's real estate or artwork or anything else. Or it can say that your family members can inherit certain percent of your estate, what you own at the time of your death. Now, if you don't have a will, then under the Illinois Probate Act, your heirs will be determined by the statute. So the statute, for example, says that if you are married at the time of your death, your spouse inherits. If you have children, again, the statute would provide who inherits and what percentage. It would also talk about what happens if one of your children predeceased you, meaning passed away before you did, but had living children. Do those grandchildren inherit? And the statute would also um, not exclude anyone from inheriting. So if you, for example, wanted to provide in your will that a certain individual, an heir, should not inherit from you, then if you don't specify that in a will, it won't happen because your wishes were not clearly conveyed in a legally binding document. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, also, if you don't have, excuse me, if you don't have a will, there are certain legal obligations. Taking care of your final wishes and final um, financial matters would be obligated to do. So, for example, if you die without a will in Illinois, then a probate proceeding has to be initiated. What does that mean? That means that following your death, um, a probate case would have to be filed in the county where you resided. And when that probate case is filed, generally probate proceedings take 12 to 14, sometimes 18 months to conclude. And that is because there are certain things that have to happen. So for example, when you open a probate estate, um, the first court appearance will require for you, if you're acting as the executor, as the person who will be, or administrator, as the person who will be wrapping up the final affairs of the deceased person, and to one, 
file documents indicating what had happened to produce a death certificate and to file an affidavit that details the family relationships of the person who passed away. So you would have to specify who um, the deceased person's parents were. Was the deceased person married? Did the deceased person have any children? If they did not have children and no spouse, were there any siblings? If there were siblings um, and they predeceased, did the siblings have children? Basically tracing out and laying out the entire family tree. So at the end of that affidavit, you can say the only heirs who can inherit under the probate act are these specific people and of those people usually one of the heirs will petition to be the administrator or executor of the estate um so you would say in that affidavit of those heirs i'm one of them and i'm asking the court to allow me and to name me as the administrator or the executor if the court agrees and there are no objections, then the letters of office are issued. I'll come back to that in a moment because you might have a situation where there are different family members who disagree as to who the administrator might be or who the executor might be. So you might have siblings or cousins filing competing um, claims to be named as the administrator or the executor. And if that happens, at that point, you have multiple attorneys involved. You have um, certainly higher legal costs that you're dealing with. And the case becomes more complicated, which can mean it will take longer and be more costly to finalize. But let's say we're dealing with a best case scenario when you fail to to plan and, and do not have a will. And this is all to encourage you to actually get a will and do estate planning and think about it. Although it can be difficult to think of our own mortality and how we want things to unfold once we're gone. But this best case scenario, let's say you are petitioning to be the administrator or the executor and none of the other potential heirs are objecting. In fact, they're saying, you know, you want the headache, go ahead, deal with it. If letters of office are entered, it's a document that you will then send to any bank where there are bank accounts that were owned by the deceased person. If you're selling real estate, well, someone will have to sell the deed. Someone will have to sign the documents necessary to finalize a closing. So the title company will want to see the letters of office, will want the administrator of the estate who has binding power through the courts to sign that document. Otherwise, you will not be able to sell that real estate. Once you have letters of office, you are also have certain obligations. So for example, you have to publish and let possible creditors know that the person whose estate was open passed away. And from that date of publication, the creditors have a certain period of time, usually, usually at least six months, to file a claim in the estate. That means that they can file written documents indicating that the deceased person owed them money. For example, they had a credit card through their bank and the bank wants that debt repaid from the estate. Or the deceased person had a child and owes uh, back child support as well as potential future child support because the child is a minor. Well, if that happens, then in the probate proceeding, the judge can take a look at what assets there are and can prioritize them based on what the statute says. So there are certain creditors who are placed above others 
in terms of priority, which can make a difference between being paid the entire debt or receiving a portion of it or maybe receiving nothing. So with the example regarding the child support, you would have the other parent of the child, if the child is a minor, asking not only that money be paid from the estate for back child support, but also that the court look at the estate and set some money aside for future expenses of the child, whether that means just child support or future college expenses. Um, in addition, once you get through the claims process, you will have to provide accountings to the court. So you will have to produce written documents for your attorney, most likely, because this is not something that you will most likely do on your own. So you would produce written reports to the court indicating what debts there were, how were they paid, what assets exist, whether any were sold. So for example, if the deceased person owned any real estate and that real estate was sold, what happened with the money from the sale? Was the money placed into a bank account? Is it being divided between heirs? Again, all of those details have to be provided to the judge. And then finally, when everything has been resolved and wrapped up and you're in court to present a final report, then the judge will decide whether to close out the case, whether everything was done correctly, whether the money was distributed correctly, and whether the debts had been paid correctly. And if, if in fact, um, everything was done accurately and correctly, then the judge wa will sign off on closing the estate. What that means is at that point, all the money has been paid out to the heirs or creditors. There's nothing left. And there's an order entered saying the probate proceeding is done. And that's why it usually takes 12 to 18 months. It can be more efficient if you have a will. You are also able to save money, not just on the legal process, but also on certain requirements that the statute imposes if there is no will. So for example, if you have a will, you can say that you do not require your administrator or executor to have to purchase a bond. What does that mean? Bond is type of a, an assurance, a, a, an insurance that if you don't have a will and you die in Illinois, when the probate process is initiated, you actually have to buy this type of insurance. Um, you would go to a bondsman or your agent, um, excuse me, your attorney would contact one on your behalf. Usually the value of the bond has to be at least 1.5 times the value of the estate. So let's say you left an estate valued at a million dollars. Well, the bond would have to be purchased for 1.5 the value of that estate. And you pay that bond to the surety or the bond company. And there's no way around it. If there was no will left, um, you have to buy this surety. You have to buy this bond. And also, it is only available or you purchase, purchase it in one-year increments. So if your case is not finalized within 12 months from filing, you will then have to renew it once you pass a 12-month period. Um, quick question in terms of wills, and, and this gets asked a lot. Um, what if I just sit down and I write down my wishes? Will that be binding? Not in Illinois. There are states which will accept handwritten wills. Not in Illinois. It has to be prepared by an attorney. You have to have certain number of witnesses. Witness your will, you signing your will. And why is that? Why do we want those witnesses? We want them so that in the event there is a dispute in the future between your heirs, whether you were in the right frame of mind, had the capacity, were able to enter into a legal document 
and what happened at that process where you signed the document, those witnesses might be called to testify. And so when we execute wills, when we have them signed, I generally will um, engage my client and the witnesses in the conversation so that the witnesses can see that my client has the capacity, can understand you know, what day it is, can have a conversation. There are no concerns in terms of whether this person can enter into a legal agreement. So that's um, a, a small primer on wills. Now, you can also go to the Cadillac of estate planning, right? And have a trust prepared. What does a trust accomplish and what's involved? Generally, if you have a trust prepared, and you want to do that in combination with a special type of a will. It's called a pour over will. And it basically would state that if at the time of your death, there were any assets that had not been previously transferred to the trust, then that will, that special will at the time of your death, authorizes the transfer of your assets into the trust. Now, if you have a trust prepared on your behalf, then you can determine that you will be the first trustee. What does that mean? You will be the first person who has the controlling authority over the property in the trust, um, as well as obligations imposed on a trustee. So for example, you will have to do an annual accounting, and that's a recent thing in Illinois. Um, the Trust Act was changed in effect of January of 2020. Um, you might be required to give certain information to potential um, beneficiaries of the trust. Again, something new that was changed in January of 2020. And, and there's quite a bit more than that. Um, but your trust allows you to also then have provisions regarding how do you want your beneficiaries in the future to benefit from what you're placing in the trust. And by that, I mean, let's say you have minor children and you're concerned that they might not have the maturity to handle their finances the way you would have liked them to if they were to receive access to money at a very young age. Well, you can, in the trust, provide that the trustee can spend money on behalf of the beneficiaries, whether that's you, if you're incapacitated and you're the first beneficiary, and that can be for your medical care and any other living expenses, or if you're gone and the beneficiaries are your minor children, and then the trustee can spend the money on behalf of the children, whether that means their living expenses, their medical expenses, or their educational expenses. You can also provide that once the children reach adulthood, that they will receive certain amounts from the trust, whether that is um, small amounts or you want a full and complete distribution at a certain point, you can specify that. I have had clients decide that they want their children to receive something at age 21, but it's not majority of the funds in the trust. And maybe they get an additional distribution at the age of 25 or they get access to additional funds at age 25. And maybe there's a third distribution at age 30 or a final distribution. And then there are those who create trusts and there are sufficient assets in the trusts where the corpus of the trust um, remains and the distributions are in such amounts that you're not, never really depleting the trust completely. If you decide to have a trust and a will combination, then that allows you to avoid the probate process. That would be one of the many reasons why you would want a trust created you don't have to go through that extensive 18-month process, and you don't necessarily have to 
file all of the documents with the state. You would file a copy of the will, and the will says if there are any assets at the time of my death, they should be transferred to my trust, and here's the administrator. And by the way, I waive the requirement for the administrator to have to buy that surety bond. So it's a very limited information that's contained in the pour over will. But the detail is really in the trust. And that is where you will find the information. And that's where you as the trust set law um, provide the guideline, guidance as to your wishes and what you would like to see happen once you're gone. There are also financial reasons for creating trusts, and that, again, depends on um, the value of your estate and, and frankly, um, what is happening legally. And by that, I mean, um, within the last 10 years, you might have heard that there were federal and state issues related to taxes paid upon death on the value of your estate and that the limits on those were changed. And in fact, the federal statute and the Illinois statute differ. They have become uncoupled. They used to be at the same amounts that were possible to pass on to your heirs without having to pay estate taxes. So depending on the value of your estate, that might be another reason to look at a trust and a will combination. And again, um, these are just major themes to consider when you're looking at um, estate planning, trust, wills, and powers of attorney. But at this point, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have on these issues. Awesome, Anna. That's That was some great information for all these ladies out there. Um, one of the first questions that we have is, is the process of going through this, setting up an appointment with an attorney, or everyone Googles everything and there are free forms online that we can all download? Um, are those really protecting me, or what's the best process um, or next steps I should take? Talk to an attorney, get the information that's specific to you in the state where you reside. Because as I mentioned, um, there might be states where, yes, sitting down and writing out your wishes might be sufficient. Illinois is not one of them. Mm -hmm. You handwrite your will and assume that it will be binding. It will not be. And there might also be certain considerations that you're not thinking of. And I didn't go right. into in the presentation because it's a little bit different. But for example, what if you have a disabled child? Mm -hmm. You will want specific type of a trust created so as not to endanger the federal and um, state benefits that that child is receiving and hopefully will continue to receive as an adult. So mm -hmm. you want to consult with an attorney on this. That's a great point. And then if someone moves, is this something that they should update every time they move to a different state? Yes, and you're going to hate this answer too, but I'm going to say you should update it every few years. Okay. There's a significant life change. For example, you get married, you get divorced, mm -hmm. baby born, there's a baby adopted or, or an adult adopted. You can have adult right. adoptions, but whenever there's a significant life change, um, you want to review those. Also, one quick point, and I didn't get into it in the presentation, life insurance policies and beneficiary designations. If you are divorced or are going through the process of divorce, it's really important to update those. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's important to keep an eye on the beneficiary designation at any point in time because they are binding. Life insurance policy proceeds are transferred outside of the probate process. Mm. So on your life insurance policy, have the name of your ex-spouse whom you divorced 15 years ago, <laughs> and they're still named as a beneficiary. Guess what? It's they get it. possible that they get it. Yes, yes. 
and again, the, the litigation will be quite expensive and it will depend on the state where you find yourself. But yes, there have been instances where the ex-spouse got the life insurance policy. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that I can see that being a something you do definitely want to keep up on for sure. Um, yeah. I, I just want to jump in and say those were excellent points. And like we did say earlier, these are kind of, you know, love letters to your families and really securing this information. And, you know, it does sound complicated. It sounds like a lot of information, but basically it's just every individual needs to think through their own individual scenario, which is different for everyone. Like you were saying, different scenarios. So, um, and life changes faster than we know it. And, <laughs> I mean, before you know it, your kids are grown and they have kids or whatever it might be. And you haven't looked at those documents again. So I almost mm -hmm. feel like we should have a national holiday every day. That's <laughs> national update your beneficiaries or check your financial documents or something like that, because it's so easy to let this go. Yeah. So um, these reminders are really, really important, especially for women, uh, so that they are um, well attended to in their financial decisions and financial considerations. And um, so that nothing is left unsaid. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Okay, great. Um, so good. Thank you, Anna, for your time. Um, we appreciate it greatly. Uh, Max, what else do we have coming up? Yeah, so tomorrow night will be our fifth night that we're here, and we're going to have um, Samantha on to talk about steps to take now for a safe, secure, and fun retirement, all leading up to a um, housing seminar on Saturday at 11 Central, um, which is going to be about housing and home buying. Um, so we really appreciate you coming on here tonight, Anna. You can always read, reach Anna at Anna at AnnaLaw.com. Um, and you have your own practice, correct? Yes. And it's actually AnnaKLaw.com. But yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll make sure that's right in the handout. Um, so Anna at AnnaKLaw.com um, and we'll give the handout tomorrow um, to give an overview of this presentation and we'll see you guys all again um, tomorrow for a fearless Friday financial funness <laughs> on Friday <laughs> on Fridays. So um, thank you so much, Anna. We really appreciate it. it was thank you, Anna. Good night. Good night, everyone.